द बैटल ऑफ आफ दीव का इज फाइनली ओवर एंड द रशन हैव गेन्ड अ प्रिस्टीज पोलिटिकल विक्टरी वाई वॉज आफ दीव का सो इम्पॉर्टेंट इट वॉज इम्पॉर्टेंट टू द राशन बिकॉज इट वॉज फ्रॉम आफ दीव का दैट द यूक्रेनियन आर्टिलरी वॉज डायरेक्टली शेलिंग दॉन्तेस्क द कैपिटल सिटी ऑफ द दॉन्तेस्क राशन स्पीकिंग पॉपुलेशन विच हैज बीन टेकन ओवर बाय द राशन uh that this daily shelling of populated areas was taken as a big uh, blow to the prestige of the russians and therefore uh, putin himself was very keen that avdivka should be liberated at the earliest quite obviously this became a very hard slog battle of attrition with heavy losses to the russians but it was a very hard grind the russians carried out a slow moving double envelopment of avdivka from both the flanks the intention was to pose a threat to the ukrainian lines of communication and you know induce the ukrainians to withdraw by this primarily threat to their line of retreat to induce them to withdraw and not to stand up and fight like they tried to do at bakhmut <coughs> general zaluzhny the very popular chief of the ukrainian armed forces he was removed by zelensky and the person who has taken charge his number 2 is an ethnic russian and he is a very unpopular general with the uh, with the ukrainian armed forces he is called the butcher because in in bakhmut he tried to uh, fight a last uh, round last man kind of a battle leading to a loss of a very large percentage of the defenders in bakhmut subsequently he was charged with trying to attack and recapture bakhmut in a very futile series of assaults suicidal assaults he pushed his troops to the extent that they had started refusing to obey the orders to advance any further or to launch suicidal attacks uh he had taken charge and uh, it was feared at least the ukrainian troops were very worried that he would again get a lot of them killed but he sort of made a concession to common sense he tried to get them out he tried to launch counter attacks to open their ways for a, a safe retreat but it was not a very well organized retreat and uh, there were 8 uh, to 900 ukrainian troops who were captured uh, in this particular withdrawal uh, heavy losses have again been suffered Uh, of course the ukrainians are putting a big gloss on it they say that zelensky recently said that only 30000 uh, ukrainian troops had been killed in the fighting over the last 2 years plus so far uh, this seems to be a gross underestimate given the fact that last year they have taken a heavy pummeling in their various uh, offensive operations with the fall of avdivka it was hoped that there would be a reality check in washington and the west it was hoped that they would now have a far more realistic estimate what the U- ukrainian armed forces could achieve with a mix mishmash of weaponry from the united states and so many different european countries with their attendant problems of matching of ammunition to the weapon etc uh, spare parts and fuel etc for different types of equipment there are severe limitations of the ukrainian armed forces who were being asked to attack in the total absence of air superiority in fact they were at the receiving end as far as air power was concerned so uh, we thought there would be a concession to common sense and perhaps there would be a ceasefire it was optimistically hoped that there would be the beginning of peace talks peace parleys leading to a pause at least in the battle in europe the ground war in europe unfortunately nothing of that sort has happened it is now transparently clear that the united states and europe have decided that if they are seen as dumping the ukrainians if they are seeing as being unable to fulfill their commitments they had made so publicly and so grandiosely in front of the whole world that they would uh, push for a ukrainian victory against russia 
and then what a come down it has been steadily. It would be a, a, a terrific loss of face for uh, America and the West per se. Therefore, the following decisions have been taken. The United States is increasingly getting worried that it is being bogged down in a ground war in Europe as far as the Ukraine theater is concerned. It is being bogged down in another trouble spot in the Middle East where there seems to be no sign of an end to that conflict. The three H's, the Hezbollah, the Houthis and the Hamas, they are all combining their strength along with the Shia militias in Syria and Iraq to hit back at the United States and at uh, Israel. And uh, Israel is also not uh, been able to completely destroy the Hamas militarily and politically as it had set out to. It, uh, the war is going on and on. And uh, what the American greatest worry is that if Iran gets involved in the battle, this would require a very heavy committal of United States military resources, two to three aircraft carriers at the minimum, along with a lot of air power, possibly some ground troops. That would detract in a very major way if China decides to exploit the American preoccupation in Ukraine and the Middle East and launches an all-out offensive against Taiwan, Philippines, etc. Therefore, it has been decided that the United States will pivot to Asia and the heavy lifting will be done now in Ukraine by the European countries. The simple fact is that the Europeans so far were providing the financial heft. 90 billion dollars have been given by the European countries to Ukraine. Out of this, almost 80 billion dollars was financial aid to keep the economy of Ukraine going. The Americans had given about 60 billion dollars worth of aid, out of which 40 billion dollars plus purely was military aid. The American aid was primarily focused on military. The United Kingdom had given about 15 billion dollars so far to Ukraine. Now the American aid to Ukraine was very, very incremental, very, very, you know, uh, step by step because they were seriously worried, the Biden administration, of an all-out escalation. They didn't want to push the Russians to a point that they would resort to tactical nuclear weapons or even higher and or expand the conflict in terms of spatial spread. Therefore, the American supply of weapons, as I mentioned, was very graduated, very incremental. At the outset, they gave about 10,000 javelins, 3,000 stingers. Now, these are the kind of weapons that had been given even in the Afghanistan war because they were primarily, uh, you know, designed for guerrilla operations. Even the Americans earlier thought that it would be all over for Ukraine in 7 to 10 days and thereafter Ukraine would wage guerrilla warfare against the Russians. But that is not the way it happened. So Europe will now have to do the heavy lifting, primarily Germany and uh, Poland and France. Now this implies that the bulk of the armaments will now come from Europe because as we are aware, there is a logjam in the American Senate who, where the Republicans have been fighting a rearguard action to see that uh, no further uh, American uh, financial aid, military aid goes towards Ukraine. They see it as a hopeless lost cause and they would rather focus on the Mexico border. The simple fact is that the Ukrainians will now have to supply the bulk of the weapons they'll have to carry the can for the land war in Europe. Now, the Ukrainian armed forces have been asked to go on the strategic defensive. Their lunatic frontal assaults in the last year, 2023, have caused them heavy manpower losses and heavy losses of equipment. They cannot sustain this and as a concession to common sense, 
they have been told to now switch to the strategic defensive rather than any further idiotic assaults of a kind which had played right into the hands of the Russian. So they are now going to switch to the strategic defensive. They are also now trying to copy the Survakin line, create a Survakin line to prevent any further Russian advances, switch back to the strategic defensive, which is less costly in terms of manpower and equipment. Uh, how far this will work remains to be seen. Now, psychologically, to cover up for this, you know, obvious switch to the defensive, obvious loss of military initiative. What the Ukrainians are now going in for is a large number of attacks by their drones, a large number of, uh, you know, naval strikes on the Russian fleet in the Sea of Azov in the Black Sea, where they have gained some successes. Now, these are mostly for the optics. These are mostly for the optics. As far as the ground war is concerned, we can clearly discern who the winner is. What the Europeans have now been told to do is to sign separate 10 year contracts to show their commitment, to show their commitment to the cause they are signing or to the cause of Ukraine. They are nations have gotten together, Canada, uh, Italy, etc., have already signed 10 year defense deals with the Ukrainians. And the rest of the European countries will also follow suit as part of the strategy of Europe to do the heavy lifting for the land war in Europe. Now, this implies that Ukraine is virtually a part of NATO. If I mean uh, uh, 15, 20 European countries are going to sign individual 10 year long defense pacts with, the, uh, with Ukraine, to supply it weapons, equipment, ammunition, etc. In simple terms, it implies that Ukraine is de facto a member of NATO alliance. Now, this was the precise Russian red line because of which all this fracas had started in the first place. How will the Russians react to this? I'm afraid this is going to lead to a severe escalation. So far, in hindsight, it is quite clear that the Russians have been pretty cautious and restrained. They have tried to avoid, absolutely avoid crossing the tactical nuclear threshold. They have tried to absolutely avoid spreading the war in spatial terms to the rest of Europe or to any other NATO country, because that would trigger the uh, NATO clause, attack on one is an attack on all. So the Russians have been very cautious. The Americans and the Europeans are now trying to exploit this Russian caution, conservative attitude to try and provoke. They are going to try and provoke Russia to the extent of giving F-16s to the Ukrainians to launch offensive operations, not just you know, try and gain air superiority over the, uh, the battlefield, the ground battle area, but also to launch offensive operations against the Russians via drone attacks on their cities, on their military installations deep inside Russia, uh, which will be very high on optics, even if they are low on military effectiveness. But the aim would be to try and humiliate and to try and show Russia down. And to provoke it to an extent that it, I don't think they would be very interested in Russia crossing the tactical nuclear threshold. But the whole design now seems to be that to try and provoke Russia to that point. So that leads us to the next question. What will the Russian response be? Primarily, in my view, the Russian response would be to now instead of hoping for a ceasefire and they have you know they have tried for uh, ceasefires even before don't forget in 1922 in the month of march they had undertaken serious negotiations in belarus and in turkey to have a ceasefire to have a withdrawal of troops and as a gesture of goodwill they had withdrawn their forces from Kyiv. 
what did the west do it tried to broadcast that agreed to withdrawal as some kind of a rout of the russian army and you know the the the, the hoopla about the ukrainian victory ukrainians have won ukrainians have won was you know this was the advantage they took of the russian gesture to try and have peace talks to try and have a cease fire because uh, putin's grand strategy is that the ukrainian that the ukrainians ultimately are slavs they are their cousins slav cousins and he does not want to have a bitter blood feud going on for centuries now because he 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 feels that uh, ukraine was once part of the russian empire and uh, they have blood ties they have kinship ties across borders and he does not want to push uh, the or rub the ukrainian noses in the sand so much that uh, reconciliation becomes impossible that is why he had started a uh, 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 limited military operation uh, as he called it a special military operation and not a standard all out russian assault which uses very heavy masses of manpower very high tech equipment to go for all out victory to go for the destruction of the other side as they had done in the second world war with the germans this was a very very painfully limited operation in which putin was forced by public opinion in russia to graduate to higher levels left to himself he was very keen to limit it to just 150000 men out of which only about 90000 had entered ukraine so uh, the fact of the matter is that putin has been uh, you know felt betrayed he feels he has been betrayed twice because of his efforts to try and get a uh, peace talks going uh, putin was being very uh, very rational very very uh, what shall i say accommodating when he had that uh, interview with the fox a uh, former fox uh, editor uh, i mean the points that he made were rather rational and he seemed conciliatory he seemed conciliatory but now with this kind of a decision clear cut decision from the americans that they will extend this war at least till the elections take place in november in the united states because biden just doesn't want to lose lose face and if in the bargain hundreds and thousands of uh, ukrainian citizens are killed uh, i mean it's small change nobody gives a damn nobody cares in the west they are very keen to fight russia to the last ukrainian standing they have imposed another round of sanctions please don't forget that the initial that the initial american uh, strategy was that the to provoke to keep poking russia in the eye till it was forced to lash out and start a war the moment it did it was it would be and it was painted as an aggressor universally and you know uh, threat to the global order etc etc were all cited in the propaganda narratives but the fact of the matter is that now russia will be forced to take action to protect itself and its military reputation what form could that take the lavrov and the others have articulated the strategy of trying to push back ukrainian armed forces to a distance from where their long range weapons would not be able to target mainland russia per se that in effect means in topographical terms that they would push the ukrainians back to the line at least of the dnieper river that they would push back towards the kharkiv sector and avdivka gives them a chance to uh, progress operations towards that side or even towards the side of kyiv and they could even try and cross the dnieper and try and take the last port of ukraine which is odessa so this seems to be the most likely russian course of military course of uh, option or of choice that they would now like to mount an offensive they have already gotten about 270000 of their uh, conscripts 
uh, some reports by Mearsheimer indicate that about 500,000 more Russians have been conscripted and the Russian industrial mobilization is uh, far, far better than the mobilization in either the United States or Europe. You can see the way they are able to churn out artillery, ammunition, uh, missiles and uh, cruise missiles and tactical ballistic missiles. They are now also mass producing drones. So they are much better placed as far as industrial mobilization is concerned. To that extent, the Russians are better able to withstand a long war. So what kind of a war can we look forward to or anticipate? I don't think th th there is no question of blitzkrieg in this kind of a war. It is reminiscent now of the positional warfare of World War I, not even World War II, precisely the, the, you know, the lines, etc., where you keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. You may get a sudden breakthrough at a point in time, but uh, there will be nothing spectacular. A hard grind, hard slog of attrition with the victory going to the side that can sustain manpower losses, can recoup manpower losses and whose industrial mobilization is superior. I am afraid so far the Russian industrial mobilization has been far superior to that of the United States or of Europe. Don't forget that in the period of unipolarity, Russia, uh, the Americans never felt the need or the threat of any this kind of a uh, symmetric warfare. They were only fighting asymmetric warfare against weak opponents like Iraq, like Afghanistan, like Syria, like Libya, etc., etc., or even the Serbs. So they did not have need for that kind of a sustained World War II, World War I style industrial mobilization. They have not been able to produce the ammunition in the quantities to keep even the Ukrainian army supplied. Whereas the Russians have been churning out uh, by the million the artillery rounds and replacement missiles and cruise missiles and uh, tactical ballistic missiles as also drones, as also tanks, as also artillery equipment. So this is going to be a hard slog battle. The Russians within this constraint of this hard slog battle may try and now achieve a desirable end state in terms of pushing all the HIMARS, all the long range Ukrainian weapons, short range, uh, you know, drones. They, they would push them behind the Dnieper river line so that they cannot directly target the territory of the Russian Federation. What if they are pushed beyond the point? If they are pushed beyond the point, they could do the following. They could go for smaller operations. The Kalinin-Grad, uh, you know, corridor is one area where they could push for. Uh, they could, they could, if push comes to shove, you know, try and either go for Poland, which is the base of all this, and even if it risks a war with uh, NATO, well, then so be it. Uh, they could, in such a conflict, definitely use tactical nuclear weapons because uh, they do not have the conventional capability as of now. They haven't mobilized fully for that kind of a war in Europe in which the whole of NATO is activated against them. So this is the future. I'm afraid the world is heading for a bleak future. We have a shooting war, a land war in Europe raging, shows no sign of stopping at least not till the American elections, because Biden feels he will lose face. He is prepared to efface a large number of Ukrainians, get their towns blasted to smithereens, but he doesn't want to lose face in, 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 in front of the rest of the world for an inability to live up to his commitments to you know, ensure a Ukrainian victory. You forget a Ukrainian victory now. They are looking for a Korea-style stalemate which also seems very difficult to achieve. So this war is going to continue. There is another shooting war now on in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. It started on the 7th of October. 
as of now shows no sign of stopping at best we could have a ceasefire of a month plus two months in which partial exchange of hostages but then i'm afraid this will sputter on there could be both sides are very keen to avoid escalation here both the united states and iran as a very conscious strategy the united states has been very careful not to provoke iran to enter the fray iran is also keen to keep you know uh, mounting pressure through the three h's the hamas the hezbollah and the houthis as also the shia militias in syria and iraq he's been doing a fairly good job you know in terms of least expenditure of resources he's been able to utilize the three h's in a very effective manner the point at issue is that general soleimani was killed before this war started he was the man really in control of these iranian proxies the so called axis of resistance but uh, with with soleimani's death the iranian control over these uh, three h's and the uh, the shia militias in syria and iraq has weakened considerably will they be able to call the shots in a day to day manner they are not they are just supplying them the weaponries the parts for fabricating missiles rockets etc uh, so they are the supply chain now whether america will be compelled to attack this supply chain only time will tell if if the provocations get beyond a certain point well even america has to save its face it cannot be seen as a pushover to repeated 45 houthi attacks on the merchant shipping so far and uh, now the attacks are getting more and more lethal the americans have been launching air strikes including with b1 b strategic bombers 12000 km range bombers from the continental united states onto yemen onto yana the capital etc they have failed to deter the houthis because very simply the houthis are combat hardened they are quite used to being bombed day in and day out by the saudi arabians using the american supplied f15s f16s etc it, the, the saudis were not able to uh, browbeat or clobber the houthis into submission after 8 9 years of non stop bombing so it is doubtful whether the repeated attacks by the f18 hornet squadron on the uss eisenhower the five ships one cruiser three destroyers and one aircraft carrier which are there in the red sea region will they be able to even with four tornadoes coming from cyprus as a show of force will they be able to able to deter the houthis from repeated attacks these houthi attacks on the merchant shipping are now extracting a heavy cost let's uh, talk of india 50% of our exports 30% of our imports are in through this red sea corridor through the suez canal which is taking a big hit the world is already facing a recession japan and the united kingdom have already slipped into a recession how long can the world take this remains to be seen so there are major efforts being made to try and stop this conflict or at least get a temporary uh, cease fire going uh, a temporary halt to the fighting israel is not prepared to accept a total cease fire uh, because they have not been able to achieve their military objectives as of now they still feel that they'll have to attack the city of rafa where the last uh, houthi elements have taken refuge now amongst the refugees so uh, this this continue this uh, this uh, this conflict in the middle east is likely to sputter on with a few breaks in between but it will continue uh the fact is will it spin out of control remains to be seen there are serious efforts from both sides to s- prevent that escalation spiral from happening but accidents cannot be ruled out the third hot spot that is now on the horizon staring us in the face will china try and take advantage of the american preoccupation 
in a land war in Europe, in Ukraine, and a raging land war in the Middle East, to now think that the time is opportune for it to finish its Taiwan problem once and for all. Will it, will it attack? If so, when? Initial estimates were that these attacks would take place somewhere in the region from 20, in the horizon, time horizon 2025 to 2027, when the Chinese military preparations would be complete and of an order that would give them the reassurance and confidence that they could carry it out. Initially, the Chinese were quite shaken by uh, what appeared like the poor Russian performance against determined defenders. The Chinese problem was even further complicated that they had to attack across 130 kilometers of the high sea. The Russian attack was across land, over land, just next door. But this is an attack that they will have to launch an amphibious assault and with a kind of, you know, uh, the enhancement of the power of the defensive. You know, any amphibious fleet can be hit by tactical ballistic missile, cruise missiles, drones and uh, whole, you know, the aircraft of the Taiwanese Air Force and quite in all probability, the American Air Force, the Japanese Air Force, other uh, Australian uh, elements could also join in to the battle. You could blast that entire armada before it touches the shore of, uh, of, of uh, Taiwan. So, uh, what form would it take, etc. Uh, the Chinese were initially hesitant, but now they seem to have regained their confidence. The met conditions and the tide conditions will now be uh, uh, very, very conducive in the month of April, May. The next window comes in August this year, 2024. And there is a school of thought that the Chinese may well attack. There are battle indications of that, early battle indicators which are coming in, in terms of the fact that the American, uh, that the Chinese are trying to take out their money that is exposed in uh, American uh, banks, European banks, so that you know, they, they don't uh, face the same problem as the Russians. That the Americans simply gobbled up $300 billion worth of Russian reserves that were in their banks. Uh, they are trying to stockpile uh, food stocks, wheat, as also petrol, fuel, oil, lubricants. And the fact is that they did not touch these food stocks even during the COVID problem, when their people were almost starving. They have been collecting blood banks. You know, they have been collecting blood in their blood banks. So, these are pretty meaningful indications. And the Chinese rhetoric has been very clear. The, he's been warning them of very, uh, you know, he's been asking them to prepare for high, uh, high level of conflict. So, with all this and the increasing truculence of the Chinese that we are seeing, against the Taiwanese, uh, uh, against the Taiwanese, against the Filipinos, uh, we could well have a flare-up here. There is also Venezuela, which is threatening to attack its neighbor, has already launched some operations. So the fact of the matter is, we are staring at World War III. And all in an year of elections in the United States, when the domestic dissonance is of a very high order, of an order that, that is worrying. We've seen how the Republicans and, you know, the bipartisan consensus over Ukraine seems to have broken down. The Republicans are not allowing the aid to go to the Ukraine, $60 billion worth or $18 billion, $16 billion, $18 billion worth to the Israelis or to the Ukrainians. So that level of dissonance will only increase towards the elections. You know, because uh, there will be that uh, kind of a, a limbo, lame duck, governments become lame duck uh, just before elections. So if, will the Chinese not want to exploit this? Will the Chinese not try and encourage either Iran or North Korea to also jump into the fray? Whichever way we look at it, we are looking at very troubled times ahead. Thank you.